is Seth Tabachman. I'm a comic book artist. Um, I've been putting out this magazine called World War III Illustrated since 1979. I worked on it with this guy, Eric Drucker. Um, and um, among other things, I designed this uh, graphic that was used as a t-shirt for a long time for, uh, uh, to raise money for the long haul. Uh, and, um, you know, I've never really, I think I've walked into the long haul for like 15 minutes once on the way through town, but I never did a presentation here and I always wanted to. Um, so I'm going to show a bunch of my work, some of it's old, some of it's current. Um, start out with some current work. Um, Maybe we'll kill the so kitchen right too. Doing current yes, work. Um, yeah, that, it would be nice to take out that light, I think. Yeah. It's okay. Great for the film. So, um, we are the city. <laughs> we can shut it down. Yeah. So that's an older graphic, and here's something recent. Define fascism. In periods of economic crisis, when radical movements are on the rise, the ruling class put forward their own version of revolution called fascism. Hmm. Fascists are plagiarists. They take ideas from the left, from us, in order to get people to support them. So here's this guy, you might have heard of Bernie Sanders, and he yeah. says, nearly 60,000 factories in this country have closed. Much of this is related to disastrous trade agreements that encourage corporations to move to low-wage countries. Meanwhile, the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. And here's this other that's guy you might have heard of. Donald Trump. Politicians have pursued a policy of globalization, moving our jobs, our wealth, and our factories to countries like Mexico. And this has made the financial elite very wealthy, but left workers with nothing but sadness. He said that in Cleveland, no less. Wow. So. Fascists combine socialist ideas with racism and nationalism. But their real loyalty is to <coughs> other members of their class. Fascists court the cops and the Klan. They often seem obsessed with sexual morality but their own vices go unchecked. Fascists tend to be macho. There's often a transgressive sexuality associated with fascist leaders, but because they're obsessed with male power and treat women with contempt, they're the natural allies to the Christian right. And they have a similar attitude towards the natural world as they have towards women. And fascists have an interesting relationship to the idea of freedom of speech. Uh, they need freedom of speech in order to engage in hate speech, but they often make violent attacks against their critics. So uh, a painter named Ilma Gore did, you've probably seen this, this really amazing painting of Donald Trump with a very small penis mm -hmm. and she was physically assaulted by Trump supporters outside of her home. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very obsessed with employment uh, because they want to employ half of us as guards over the other half. Um, they posture as defenders of law and order but they actually have contempt for the rule of law. In fact, fascists combine criminal networks with the most aggressive factions 
of the military, police, and intelligence services to create an autocracy that serves the interest of the most reactionary section of the ruling class. The fascist ideal is an all-powerful nation-state which is allied with national business interests and gets the loyalty of one section of the ruling class, members of the dominant nationality, by giving them privileges over everyone else. And we already know what the results were of fascism in Spain, Italy, Germany, Argentina, and so we don't really need to wait to find out what they're going to do. We need to stop them while we have a chance. By the way, you said you said ruling class when you said working class in the in the drawing. Oh, um, no, I. You did. Oh, I think what I said was clear. If I made a mistake, I apologize. Um, but he, I, I think he's very picky. To say. It's an important. Well, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for correcting me. I, I probably made a mistake. Um, you didn't. He's getting old. I don't need to put it down. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying it's, it's a, it's a, it's a. Do you it's recommend any, any books? Was that based on a Let particular go, book? Or um, it was book. based on studying Trump's speeches, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That mo all, all, all of the dialogue from Trump were things he actually said. But that's I, good. I, that, 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 that's a form of plagiarism. Yeah, like it's a form of plagiarism. Yeah, yeah. among other things. Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I be annoying for a second? Okay. That thing where mm -hmm. I said you misspoke, spoke. It really is important political thing because you, you point out in the written thing it points out that fascists do appeal to a section of the working class. I, I said that. No, but you said ruling class when you were speaking. So. No, but no, but I also I also yeah. said it's uh, ruling class. But you're right. You're, you're correct. If I didn't say it, you are correct that. Fascists do appeal to a section of the rule of the working class. Yeah, I just want. To yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And if I fail to say that, thank you for correcting me. I thought I did say it. Yeah. Okay. Because it was in my script. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a piece I did actually for an Italian magazine um, in response to the election of Donald Trump. Um, Washington D.C. on the night of January nineteenth. 2017. Police and military block streets in preparation for the inauguration of Donald Trump. We are warned that anyone wearing a backpack may be searched. Some come to praise the Donald, others to protest. Some block access to the event. Police help Republicans <laughs> climb over protesters. Hundreds must be arrested before the Donald can take the oath of office. A women's strike has been called for this day. Women will refrain from jobs, housework, fake smiles. A known Nazi is punched in the head, and soon Americans begin to debate a question people in Europe have been debating since the end of World War II. Do fascists deserve the right of freedom of speech? After the inauguration, crowds gather and drift. Nearby bank windows are smashed. A limousine burns. Stun grenades explode. People run, and people go running to a concert in the park. Because the concert has a permit, it's a safe place for people to wipe away the tear gas. The band <laughs> plays a cover of the Black Sabbath song, War Pigs, as real live war pigs march past. By twilight, people are back in the street. The next day, tens of thousands attend the Women's March on Washington. Mm -hmm. There are so many people there for the march that it takes about two hours just to get on the metro to go downtown. Yeah. This thing ain't working. 
on the train, people from all over the United States meet and talk. Downtown, the crowd overwhelms the plans of the organizers. There are so many people blocking the street that there can't actually be a march. The entire parade route was full of people. So the masses swirl aimlessly through the Capitol, just happy to know that they're not alone. As we travel home, we hear the new president accusing the media of exaggerating the number of people who oppose him and minimizing his support. Well, we all know there were a lot of people in Washington, but very few of them came to support Donald Trump. In the weeks that follow, resistance to Trump becomes a daily affair. By noon, Trump will have signed some crazy new executive order. Soon an email announcement goes out, and by nightfall, people will be marching in the January cold. So this, it seemed to me at that time, seemed to be a new American, a new America, no longer a country of a silent majority, not a nation of individualists who prefer personal improvement to collective action. Everyone wants to be involved, everyone has an opinion, everyone wants to be heard. So it seems like Donald Trump has called the question as to the content of our character. Uh, you will remember that Martin Luther King said that someday we would be judged by the content of our character. And it seems like a lot of Americans want to answer that question. So, of course, this is not the first time that people have gone into the street or the first time that we've had a president whose actions were questionable. Um, and that, of course, is a photograph of Chicago in 1968. Mm. And um, I was just a kid then. I didn't get to experience any of that. But I had the privilege uh, a year or so ago of illustrating a book about Attorney Leonard Wineglass, a biography of Attorney Leonard Wineglass, who some of you will remember was the defense attorney for the Chicago Seven, for Daniel Ellsberg, uh, for Angela Davis. And so that gave me an opportunity to research that period and learn a lot more about that period, which, as I said, I saw on television as a little kid. Um, so this is one chapter from that book which is a chapter about Chicago in 68, and it's called Protest Without Permission. In 1968, many Americans felt that they had exhausted all conventional means in pursuit of peace and justice. An overwhelming majority had elected a peace candidate for president, Lyndon Johnson, but Lyndon Johnson had simply escalated the war in Vietnam. Hmm. Through a nonviolent civil disobedience movement, legal segregation in the South had ended, but little had changed for blacks in the North, and when Martin Luther King was assassinated, people felt the time for nonviolence was over. Preparations were being made for the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. LBJ was stepping down, but Hubert Humphrey, his vice president, was running in his place. Humphrey was expected to continue the war. Um, the one peace candidate running against, uh, against him, uh, Gene McCarthy, was seen as unlikely to win. And the one guy who could have beaten Humphrey for the Democratic primary, Robert Kennedy, had also been shot. <coughs> So anti-war groups like the Yippies and mobilization against the war uh, saw Chicago in 68 as a legitimate target. And they planned a number of activities to go on during the convention. They wanted to have marches through the city towards the convention. They wanted to have a festival of life in Lincoln Park. And they wanted to be able to sleep in that park. 
But the mayor would not grant them a permit to do any of that. So for the first few days, the permitless festival, festival of life took place in Lincoln Park, uh, regularly attacked by police. At night, the police would try to clear the park, and the yippies would build barricades and try to stay in the park, and their slogan <coughs> was, It's our fucking park! <laughs> um, before the eyes of the world, there were huge riots in Chicago. And these riots entered every American living room through television, which was a new medium at that time. Lyndon Johnson recognized it as a police riot, but it was Nixon who got elected, and Nixon wanted to blame it on the protesters. So Nixon picked out eight organizers and tried to say that they were the leaders of the protest and tried to charge them with incitement to riot. And they became the Chicago Eight, later referred to as the Chicago Seven. And the judge in this case, um, Judge Hoffman, uh, what, Judge Julius Hoffman, uh, was a little bit out of his mind and did a lot of unconventional and scary things and was very much on the side of the prosecution from the beginning. Uh, so it was very unlikely that anyone was going to win against him because he was already a prosecutor. Hmm. And because people knew that they could not win in court, that sort of freed the defendants to do what they did best, which was to make political theater out of the trial. So here's uh, Julius Hoffman. Who is shaking their fist at me? Well, that is Mr. Hayden. It is my customary greeting. <laughs> there will be no fist shaking in this courtroom. And defendants regularly interrupted the judge, interrupted the prosecutor, spoke out in court, um, and eventually one defendant, Bobby Seal, was bound and gagged in court. Um, and the spectacle of a black man bound and gagged in an American court of law was so upsetting to people that his case was severed and he was able to walk away from this case earlier. Um, but it had really angered people and really woke a lot of people up. And so there was an action during the trial called the Days of Rage in which members of Students for Democratic Society ran through the streets with helmets and uh, broke windows. In the end, um, most of the defendants were convicted. The jury found them guilty, and they were given long prison sentences. But Leonard Weinglass appealed this ruling to a higher court, and his argument was that Judge Hoffman was not impartial, that the judge was in fact an activist seeking combat, combat, combat with the defendants, that he took things personally, and he turned the court of law into an armed camp. And based on the power of these arguments, the appellate court overturned the conviction of the Chicago Seven. And so Leonard Weinglass is really sort of the unsung legal superhero who freed the Chicago Seven. So what do we get out of this? You know, what does it mean that this happened? Um, was it a victory, a spectacle? survival. Um, what I get out of it is that every demonstration in the United States since 1968 is either looked at as a reenactment or an attempt to reenact Chicago 68 mm -hmm. or a repudiation of what happened in Chicago in 1968. So here was an, a meeting I was actually in where we were planning an action at the World Bank, and Starhawk gets up and says, we should have a festival of life in the park across the street from the World Bank. And people were like, what is she talking about? 
right? And th we didn't realize as young people that, uh, or younger people, that when she said Festival of Life, she was talking about the biggest political riot in American history. Huh. But we just thought she wanted to have a Festival of Life, you know? <laughs> so we didn't get that. Um, a lot of groups like United for Peace and Justice um, make sure that all of their demonstrations have permits. And because that makes demonstrations very safe, their demonstrations are very large. But because they're uneventful, the news very often doesn't cover those demonstrations. Um, groups like ACT UP or Black Lives Matter want to stress the urgency of what they're saying, so they have protests that are smaller without permits and they block traffic. Um, the Black Bloc is a tactic very much like the Days of Rage, almost exactly the same thing, and it's been used all over the world. The occupation of public space has been a very effective tactic, whether it was in Tompkins Park or Tahrir Square. Uh, in a few places in the world, this has led to the collapse of dictatorships. The crackdown on the occupations in um, the Middle East has been very brutal. Allah, one of the leading dissidents in Egypt, uh, received a five-year prison sentence and the reason the crime he was convicted of was having a demonstration without a permit. Uh, because of court rulings against police for mass arrests, there are a lot of cities that are a little bit more open to demonstrations without permits now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. Um, in um, Paris, during the climate, UN Climate Summit, uh, there had recently been a terrorist attack, um, and um, so they banned all demonstrations. And so you had thousands of people who come to Paris to protest the Climate Summit, and they were told they couldn't have a protest. And so people did a lot of creative things to get around that, such as this action where people put hundreds of shoes in the place where they would have had a demonstration. So this continues to be a question, um, how can we use public space? Are we allowed to access public space? Um, and who decides that? Do we need a permit for that? So going forward a little no. to uh, yeah. my lifetime, our lifetime, the things we've dealt with. We dealt with this guy named Ronald Reagan. And the big difference between Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump is that Ronald Reagan actually was the president of the United States. That is, he was elected by a majority of the people um, and was extremely popular in spite of all the insane things he wanted to do. And I think for me and for Eric um, and for some other people in this room, really, we gave the best years of our lives to fighting Ronnie Reagan. Um, and what we found out was that we weren't going to get rid of him, that he was really popular. So we started to focus on our own neighborhood mm -hmm. and what we could do on a small scale in the place where we lived. Yep. Um, and our neighborhood had a big problem with gentrification. And we had that problem because you had buildings in the neighborhood that had burned down. And um, you can see here the roof of one of those buildings. Um, these buildings were being held by the city, and they were being held empty. Landlords had been allowed to burn their buildings down to get insurance, hmm. and the city had picked up the tab, and were holding the buildings empty. And what you can see here is there's a hole in the roof, which means water pours in when it rains. It rots out the beams, and the building gets even more damaged. And so a number of us decided that um, we would go into these buildings and fix them up and try to create affordable housing in these buildings. And uh, we thought that was a pretty good idea. Uh, that was being done without title or right, so it was considered to be squatting. And the mayor of New York, um, Edward Koch, 
who was always a very articulate man, whether he was moral or not, said, um, they can't do that. That's illegal. That's anarchy. They're anarchists. And we we're like, wow, you're anarchists? <laughs> and so we suddenly had this groovy little anarchist scene in Tompkins Square Park, which was a lot of fun until they cracked down both on the squats and the park, and we had to fight to defend the park as they tried to impose a curfew on the park. And our slogan was, whose fucking park? It's our fucking park. The same as the, the we didn't even know about the protests at Chicago, in Chicago that they used that slogan. We thought we invented it, okay? But actually, it was a generations old slogan. Whose hmm. fucking park is our fucking park? Um, and that got pretty heavy as they tried to evict a lot of the squats. So, this is a comic strip I did for the squatters movement to use as a recruiting tool, as an organizing tool. It was based on an article by a woman named Yolanda Ward, um, a housing activist in Washington, D.C., who was murdered in the early 1980s, so we never met her. But she claimed to have broken into the offices of housing and urban development and uncovered a government initiative called spatial deconcentration. And this was to illustrate uh, what she outlined in that article. 1968, inner city riots. A commission was set up to study those riots. A commission consisting of representatives of the military, business, and government. They did not believe that poverty had caused the riots. They blamed the riots on the people. Crowded together in the inner cities, poor people could communicate and organize and create resistance. Their solution was to break up this mass of people and drive them out of the city. Already bad areas would be allowed to get worse. Police would turn a blind eye to drugs and arson and then people would be offered buyouts to leave. The area would be renovated for a better class of people. Rents would soar, people would have to sleep on the street, while warehouse departments remained empty. This plan has already resulted in a wave of homelessness. What are people going to do about it? And so, obviously, what we wanted people to do about it was to squat the buildings. And mm. for about a decade of my life, I was really, really involved in this movement, as was Eric. Um, I got arrested about 20 times, um, got my nose broken by the police. Oof. Um, and at the end of that process, for me, I felt I could actually write a book that was semi-autobiographical and based on people I knew and things I'd done and things I'd seen other people do, and that book was called War in the Neighborhood. Hmm. And here's a chapter from War in the Neighborhood. Because they curfew our park, because they beat us, because they tear down our homes, because they make plans for our disappearance, we go to war with these cops. We go to war with these landlords. We go to war with these racists. We go to war with these fascists. We plant gardens in vacant lots. We set fires in intersections. We turn abandoned buildings into homes. We turn street corners into liberated zones. For a moment, for an hour, for a year, for a decade, 
a space opens up and we are in control. We the people seize control of public space. Seize control of housing. Seize control of those things that make up our lives. We legislate on park benches. We try the traders under street lights. Every Latin a king. Every squatter a landlord, every lunatic a philosopher, everyone for president, a democracy of blood and cement, a democracy of stolen scaffolding, a democracy of subterranean tunnels, a democracy swimming naked in the park, a democracy of flying bottles and fires in the night, the Communist Manifesto naked except for a mask and a pair of docks <laughs> strides down the middle of Avenue A, heaving bricks through the windows of police cars. And these are the best moments of our lives. The moment passes. All the fires have been put out. We tore the walls down yesterday, but today we're busy building them back up. We lie about each other. We conspire against each other. We try to evict each other. We might even try to kill <coughs> each other. We go to war with the people who live across the street. We go to war with the people who live upstairs. We go to war with the person who shares our bed. And we come face to face with this cop, which is us. With this landlord, which is us. With this racist, which is us. With this sexist, which is us. With this fascist, which is us. Is it any surprise we become the mirror image of our oppressor? Mm. Weren't we educated in their schools? Don't we consume their products? Don't we take their drugs? Aren't we the targets of their advertising? Haven't some of us also been rehabilitated in their institutions? Aren't we the descendants of slaves and peasants and fugitives? Has any of us ever experienced equality. So what would we know about democracy? If we can look at an abandoned building and imagine it full of people, if we can look at a vacant lot and imagine a garden, then why can't we look at each other and imagine what we can become with time and work? It is a good thing to take up the struggle against oppression. It is also a good thing to make mistakes in that struggle and grow wise. Yep. How else would we come to know ourselves? Yep. Amen. So this is something I think everyone here knows, but a lot of people apparently don't. And if somebody doesn't know this, you should tell them this. What everyone needs to know is the heat from the sun is trapped by greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, warming the earth, making life possible. And everyone needs to know that burning oil and coal emits extra greenhouse gases causing the earth to overheat, causing drought, melting the polar ice caps, causing the seas to rise and the land to flood. And you need to tell people that when the temperature at the ocean surface reaches 80 degrees, 
hot air rises off the water, then cooling in the upper atmosphere. The air falls, <coughs> creating a vortex, becoming a hurricane, mm -hmm. and the cities bleed. And you need to tell people that forests absorb greenhouse gases, and cutting down forests releases those gases. So if we stop logging and replace oil and coal with other forms of energy, then the earth can slowly heal. An automobile is a machine for transportation. A multinational corporation is a machine for making money. They're not in business to do anything else. You ask them, they'll tell you. They're, so they're not going to stop doing what they're doing unless we make them stop. <coughs> to fight for survival is human nature. So we the people will rise up against these corporations. And so what everyone needs to know is that we are the solution. Okay, um, I was in the West Bank with this man here, and after that I did this book called Portraits of Israelis and Palestinians for my parents. And it was full of lots of drawings I did of little kids in Israel and Palestine, and it was the most disliked book I ever did. It was all pictures of little kids, no violence, nothing like this stuff. And I did, after a while, realize that there was a problem with the way I wrote that book, which is I tried to write it in some special Jewish way that was different than the way I wrote about other things, and people could feel that. So this is a piece I did about what was going on in the West Bank a few years ago, the building of the wall. Um, and I tried to write it as though I was writing about uh, an act of police brutality on my block, mm. and it's called the Serpent of State. Mm. Wow. Out the bulletproof glass window of the settler bus, I see what looks like an American suburb. This is an Israeli settlement, one of the ones Ariel Sharon wants to protect and it's paid for by American and Israeli tax dollars. Signs point to the settlements and signs point back to Tel Aviv, but there's no sign which points to the end of the road. In fact, the bus doesn't go to the end of the road. The bus stops and turns, makes a hard left towards the settlements. So to get to the end of this road, you have to get out and walk it's as if nothing existed at the end of the road. This is Area C, Palestinian, under full Israeli occupation. And it looks nothing like an American suburb. But there is new construction going on in this sleepy village. At first it appears that the Israelis are building a long road with a deep ditch next to it. Then barbed wire is added. It appears that the Israelis are building a fence. Then in places cement and guard towers are added. The Israelis are building a wall in the middle of Palestine and that they, they say this wall is for the security of Israel. But the wall does not follow the green line, the internationally recognized border of Israel. Instead, it snakes through the West Bank, taking big bites. Um, it snakes around the larger settlements, taking big bites out of the, out of the promised Palestinian state. The wall will separate, in some places, the wall will separate Palestinian farmers from their land. In other places, it will lock Palestinians into a kind of no man's land where they won't be in Israel or Palestine, so it's not clear under what laws they'll live. 
the wall will keep farmers of the West Bank from selling produce in Jerusalem's Arab Quarter. The city of Coquilia is already completely surrounded by this wall. And of course, Israel claims that there are going to be gates through this wall. Um, gates guarded by Israeli soldiers, basically 19-year-old kids who will get to decide which person gets to go, to go through on which day. Um, and of course, everyone in Palestine knows how hard it is to get by a checkpoint. So in the end, maybe the real purpose of this wall, like so much that goes on in Palestine, is to convince the Palestinians to give up and move away. On top of the hill, Palestinians, Israelis, and people from around the world are working together, but they're not working on George Bush's roadmap. Yeah. This is a camp of peace activists protesting against the building of the wall. At Jayus, Israelis, Palestinians, and people from all over the world march to stop the building of the wall. And what was the response of the IDF? The IDF shot Palestinians, the IDF shot internationals, and the IDF shot Israelis. They're building a wall between paranoia and desperation. They're building a wall between the land and the people who used to live on it. They're building a wall and they won't call it transfer. <coughs> They're building a wall, and they're calling it a road map. They're building a wall, and they're going to call this wall peace. And when all the walls have been built, the walls will comprise a prison. Then they're going to put a flag on top of this prison, and they're going to call this prison a Palestinian state. Yep. For what, after all, is a nation state, <laughs> but a prison with a flag on it. <laughs> and that was a comic strip I did for Anarchists Against Walls and Fences. <laughs> and here's a sketch I did. Um, an, a magazine from Australia called Overland. Um, Overland wanted me to do their cover. They wanted me to do a wraparound cover in color. Um, it's a literary magazine, very good magazine. And I did a bunch of sketches of what I thought a literary magazine would want. They said, no, 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 Seth, do what you really want, do what you feel. I said, really? Do, do what I feel? Can I do something about what just happened in front of the wall, in, in, in front of the, the fences in Gaza? And they said, sure, we'd love you to do that. So I sent them this sketch, and they're like, uh, we don't know. We don't know if we can run this. And so I had to do something else for them. But I got this sketch of uh, the Great March of Return. In fact, they said, could you, could you take off this half? Just have this half. Just show the people marching. Don't show them getting shot. And I'm like, but they did get shot. Right. I can't not show them getting shot. Give me a fucking break. Right. You know, I can't do that. So anyways, this concept right now is... There's no place to run this. Right. So if anybody here knows a wall that I could put this on as a mural, a magazine that would like to publish this, please let me know, because I would love to finish this piece and get it out in print, because I spent a lot of time figuring it out, and i had been kind of hesitant to do too many pieces about what was going on in Palestine, because I feel like Palestinian artists like Mohammed Sabana need my support and they should speak about it. But when this happened, I was like, no, I've got to do something about this. Mm. Come on, this mm. is insane. So mm. if anybody knows a magazine that would want this, let me know. Mm. Yeah. If, um, button again. Too many buttons on this thing. <laughs> OK, so this is a piece that I did as stencils, and I remember Eric is one of the people who helped me spray paint these on the sidewalks around the Lower East Side. Hmm. The world is being ripped by men 
who trade in human blood. <coughs> they have no future. You will never succeed in joining their club. Don't believe what they tell you. Their weapons won't protect you. People aren't out to get you. You don't have to fuck people over to survive. Yeah. Or yourself. <laughs> the dog imitates the master, but only eats the leftovers. He has power over another man's life, but none over his own. Hmm. Unite. We can't lose. There are millions of us. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Good so thank you for your time and for uh, allowing me to speak at the long haul. Um, I do have books and magazines here um, if people want to pick them up. Um, and thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you to the long haul for um, selling this graphic to so many people who I met. Yeah. Who would be like, hey, I know that artwork. I bought that t-shirt at the long haul ten years ago. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh. Can we, can we um, continue selling? Yes, you can. Would you do me one favor? Yes. Put my name on it. Yeah. Ooh, uh, good uh, because I had this issue this week with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. Is they did a poster show, and... They had a poster that I'd done, and they had next to it unknown artists. Come and on. the poster was signed. Oh, wow. And I went, and talked to, I went and talked to them about it on Friday, and I straightened this out with them. So I think I should be consistent with both S SF MoMA and the long yeah. Put my name on it. The unknown yeah. artist, also known as yeah. Seth Tobachman. Yeah. I think the space is also open to new designs. Yeah. Well, um, you know, look, look through the stuff I've done and see if there's something that interests you. Let me know. Where is your, do you have any copies of the book on Israel that you were talking about? Um, not with me. Um, when did you go to Israel? Yeah, um, I went, well, I went there when I was a little kid. I like to be a Jewish kid in America. And I went to Palestine in, what year was that? 2002. 2002. What, what we, During the summer. I went with the uh, ISM. What month? And um, we um, went to the West Bank and we stayed in a village called Dir Ibsia, where we did art and English classes with Palestinian kids. Um, and we did go through Ramallah for a couple days when it was under curfew. Um, and then I went back there a year later. Um, and I didn't work with ISM that time. I worked with the Israeli groups with Anarchists Against Walls and Fences. And I haven't been back there since. Um, what I've been doing in the intervening years with regard to that issue is I felt, I really felt that I didn't handle that issue as well as I could have. I was very aware of all my contradictions. Um, that I come from a very strong Zionist family, that my mother was actually. Um, and she only admitted this to me shortly before her death, that mm. she was in an armed Zionist group that was going over there before 48 wow. to create the country. And that the only reason she had not been sent over was because of her diabetes, and therefore she had run their newsletter. And so I owe her diabetes my life, I think. Wow. You know, yes. Yes. Or that I either she either wouldn't have lived or I would have grown up over there. Yeah, you I, know. I was there. But but that was how just... deeply she believed in that. Wow. I was and, there with I you know, so I didn't feel that my work was very good on that subject. And what I've done instead is that in the magazine World War Three Illustrated, we've been publishing the work of Arab cartoonists who come up since the Arab Springs, such as um, Magdi Al Shafi, who wrote what is considered to be the first Arab language graphic novel called Metro, which was banned under Mubarak, and then he was again arrested under Morsi. And Magdi's joke is Mubarak put Magdi in jail, Mubarak is gone. Morsi mm. put Magdi in jail, 
more see it's gone. So you see the new government knows not to put Magdi in jail. Yeah. Um, but we also um, have an interview in that issue with Mohammed Sabana, who's a Palestinian cartoonist, who was, um, when we first became aware of him, he was being held for six months in an Israeli prison, which um, is pretty standard for young men in Palestine, really because they can hold you for six months without charges, and they do that to squeeze information out of people. Um, so I've been, we've been trying in our magazine to give English language translation to a whole bunch of young Arab cartoonists who nobody knows about here. Um, and that's mostly the work I've done on this issue, was to facilitate you know, Arab cartoonists in the United States. I haven't done that much on that, this issue, because I don't feel most of my work was that good. I feel that piece was one of my better pieces on the subject. And there's several pieces on Israel-Palestine in the book Disaster and Resistance that's right over there. Um, in, in, in the book Disaster and Resistance has the pieces on Israel. Um, but um, I did not bring um, portraits of Israelis and Palestinians. I don't, I'm not happy with that book. Um, I, there, are, there are problems with it. I mean, someday I might release a better version of it. Um, I also at one point did a project called Three Cities Against the Wall, which was um, artists in Ramallah, Tel Aviv, and New York doing a joint art show in all three cities simultaneously to protest the building of the wall. And that show had a lot of difficulties, and I decided, you know, I'm not handling this that well. So I'm much more interested in promoting the American <coughs> cartoonists. Yeah. It, I, I just noticed that your books are by uh, are distributed by AK Press, which is local, so people can probably get copies locally, yeah? Oh, yeah, you can. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, they, you, you can get them in bookstores around here. Um, although I've told they're running out of you don't have to fuck people over. Uh, that, that, that book's been through three printings, and I guess we're going to go through the next printing. You have extra copies of I the disaster? I have one copy right there. Huh? You know, but um, they, but they've told me they're running out of it, um, and um, you know. But yeah, AK Press are really really solid comrades. I'm really happy to work with them. You know, um, they've been really fair to me and other artists. You know, um, yeah. Which one is your environmental work in? The environmental your work is environment. disaster and resistance. Okay. Your work is great. Thank you. But, you know, it's, it's been said, I, I've been a long time environmentalist, and it's been said that there's trillions of dollars of oil, coal, and minerals in the earth, and they don't want it to go to waste. Uh, so the problem is that if we can't stop the, you know, global warming, or at least reduce it greatly, obviously we're in serious trouble, but at best can we just hope for a total economic collapse? <laughs> um, I think, well, that's really up to us, I think, what we want to do with this. But I, I, I think that there's, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, we're, I know. We're doing too little too late in, in, in the environment problem. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, I, it, it's cool. It's just I can't answer the question. I, I wish I was the guy who had the answer. You know, I mean, you're asking a really serious question. Um, I feel like um, um, I, I, I feel like we have the capacity to change the direction of the society because, you know, part of that's because I, I teach in a college and I meet younger people and I feel like a lot of younger people are asking good questions and are ready to do things and so I think that you know we shouldn't give up on them you know we shouldn't say there's no way of fixing this I mean you know no, I, I do have I do I do have hope and I, I do there's the potential to fix it but if we can't do it in time what's the alternative I think that <laughs> what's the, the okay we're already too late to yeah. prevent some kind of ca we've yeah. already are yeah. having yeah. floods and fires yeah. and we're so, and so in that sense and we're already too late dying every day that right but you know yeah those 
disasters create the opportunity for a reorganization of society. Sure they do. You know? <laughs> I'd love to oh, yeah. chime in a little bit. Okay. Because, uh, um, so I work with this group called uh, Actually Disaster Relief, and we've been mm -hmm. trying to organize to build decentralized autonomous, like, responses to both, like, invisible disasters, like capitalism and colonialism, but then also immediate disasters like the fires up in paradise and, like, um, we were able to, just on a DIY ethos, we're able to descend like 50,000 pounds of supplies to the hurricane in um, North Carolina, I think it was, or just mm -hmm. the disaster that was there. And, um, obviously, I didn't do that, but like the network. Can, can you give me contact information? I'd like to know more about that group. Yeah, of course. And yeah. I also, yeah, I also, it's great to meet you, because um, I'm also an arts activist and just like super inspired by the work. Cool. Anyway, cool. Yeah, I'd love to... Yeah, and I, I was one of the more expi inspiring experiences for me was working with Common Ground Relief in New Orleans yes. right after the flood. Um, that I thought, you know, that it, it was a really important thing. I, I think they made some really critical mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, that I think they, that there was a need. Okay, the, the big issue, what I feel was a mistake with Common Ground was that people. Um, prevented the demolition of the Lower Ninth Ward yeah. and fixed up a lot of people's houses, but they didn't anticipate that in order for the Lower Ninth Ward to come back, it would need services that were way beyond what a bunch of, you know, basically, you know, anarchists, young people, informally organized could provide. You would need to have the school system come back. You'd need to have the sanitation system come back. And if the city didn't want to invest in that, you know, you could embarrass them into not demolishing the area. And you could relieve any of the damage that was so, so serious that it would legitimate bulldozing a house, like if it's, you know, a health hazard. But there, were th there, there has to be a mechanism for pressuring the state or pressuring the corporations to provide what they're the only people who can provide because they're things we can't do. Right. They're things that are, it, in, unless we were to completely reorganize society, you know, to restore this society, it needs a school system, it needs a sanitation system, it needs potable water. You know, we can't informally do that. That was my, my takeaway from that. Yeah. Is that, uh, this is, uh, same point I was going to make a few minutes ago. When you use the term union, you should feel free to. One of the biggest problems I have when people discuss oh. what we should do is that we is in a very amorphous concept. True. And some like you get people to say certain things like if we all stop to buy a certain product, then you know that a certain problem will be solved. <coughs> but you know, there's no we that can make that decision. So. Um, are we talk, when we talk about we, are we talking about a, a conscious we that has some connections or just the amorphous <coughs> everybody, you know, type of thing? Um, well, I think there's a we in this room. There's, there's definitely a we in this room. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's more of a we in this room than there was in the Howard's Inn Festival. I have, I have oh. to say wow. this. There's definitely a we here. Yeah. Definitely. Like, there are conscious people. There are a lot of want to do things. There are a lot of good people. That there were. There, there, there absolutely were. A lot of good actors, I know. There were. There were. But my point is there is definitely a we in this room. I, was it, you, you were know. trying to say that the, the assessing what problems are sometimes more than the immediate. Like, yeah. That this wasn't necessarily what was in people's minds when they were working down there. Um, like when you're talking about the Ninth War. Like it might not occur to someone like, oh, this is, you know, how we, there's more than we're going to go in and try to like, preserve what's here so it makes it undemolishable or have a presence there or something but that that is if you show up there you don't necessarily think I even know, know about that stuff yeah. you're not from New Orleans you don't know what's going on with you know is that is that what your point was? well no my point my point was that okay what you had right after the after the flood in New Orleans was you had a complete failure of the government to take care of people there. Yeah. And you had people who jumped in very heroically to try and fill that gap. Um, and the two organizations I know of, and I'm sure there were others, but the two I know of were Common Ground Relief and People's Hurricane Relief. Um, Common Ground Relief was basically anarchists and older former Black Panthers. 
Um, it basically came out of the Black Bloc. Um, and um, People's Hurricane Relief was my, and I don't know them as well, but my impression is there were a lot of Communist Party people and maybe some Democratic Party people. In. But they were both small, informal groups. Um, and they were providing all kinds of services that people needed that the government should have provided. And in the Lower Ninth Ward, which is a section of New Orleans that has a really high percentage of black home ownership, probably more than any other community in the United States. You have black people who own houses for five generations in the Lower Ninth, right? They, that area was really badly hit by flooding, and the city initially wanted to tear the whole area down. They said, oh, it's not, not savable, we're going to tear it down, we're going to build casinos here. That was literally what they said. And because volunteers went in and started fixing up homes, um, and so that those homes weren't a health hazard, the city had to back off and say, okay, if people want to move back here, they can. But what the city didn't do was restore all the necessary services to restore the community, such as sanitation and potable water. They were a long time to put the plumbing back in. They were a long time to put the electricity back in. Um, they never really restored the school system. And because of that, a lot of people, even though their houses had been saved, didn't move back. You know, because it wasn't the same place. And what I kind of learned from that was that what I take away from that, and I'm sure other people who are more involved may have other things to say, I feel like, you know, our notion that we can autonomously as anarchists solve this problem all by ourselves, um, it's not quite there, that there had to be a mechanism, even though, like, we all hate dealing with the political system. You know, we have every reason to have contempt for them, but there had to be some way to force the government to do certain things. There had to be some way, not just to get them to leave us alone, but to force them to do things that we couldn't do. Or, or, or maybe overthrow an existing state and create a, a new one. <laughs> and then force yeah. that one to do something. You might not be able to do that in time for the people who live in that community that yeah. just got hit by a flood or a fire. Yeah. Is, you know, it's so you have an obligation to them to do what you can do for them. Yeah, do both well, at the same time. It's slight non sequitur, but we're uh, in slingshot in the slingshot paper. We've just been having this discussion, and we're gonna have, we haven't really had, like, voted on it, but it seemed like the tide is that we're gonna get, we're gonna move away from like ignoring uh, like the government, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and we're thinking specifically like environmental action that y y a community cannot, you know, or a small group of people cannot. We need governmental action is on this on the issues you were bringing up. Like we're gonna make a shift to a different energy system. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna happen because everybody goes and gets a little windmill and sticks it on their house. It's gonna happen because there's regulation, there's incentivization, there's you know there's uh, mm -hmm. especially regulation of mm -hmm. of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. not you can't. You're not individually gonna accomplish that because we ride our bicycles around Berkeley. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, right now there's like a lot of momentum. A, a bunch of folks are mobilizing under the name the Sunrise Movement, and they're right. working on a Green New Deal. Right. And trying exactly. to mobilize a lot of the younger populace. I mean, like the midterms just passed, and there's like a like a, a huge wave that of like folks. And there is yeah, a, exactly. Right. Yeah, and like folks, folks recognize a lot of folks because we've been having conversations as like. I mean, I, I, I was in Paris during the climate talks and stuff, so I was really stoked when I saw that image up there, but, like, a lot of the youth climate movement have been having these conversations about the relationships between, like, the, like, deep, like, mutual aid, like, anarchist, like, like politic, and then also needing to navigate bureaucratic systems to be able to support and channel resources to folks as they need it, because the system as it is is just, like, it's here. So it's, like, how to navigate both of those worlds has been, like, an ongoing real-time question we've been piecing together and it's like it's really frustrating but also we're trying to figure it out and I think the Green New Deal is like a good starting point for like getting at least the re reformer end of things to be mobilized so that we can actually start turning towards the revolutionary end of things but mm -hmm. it's all just a matter of political education too and just like getting people to like break from the illusions of stuff because it's like it's yeah it's overwhelming as fuck mm -hmm. anyway yeah. I think it's kind of fault we can't be, uh, you know, 
we that's have a false choose, dichotomy. We have to choose between just local groups of self-organization versus large-scale groups which are hierarchical and run by the capitalist class, which is, I mean, <coughs> what we really need is to have something bigger than local groups. You know, thousand times, you know, really massive spread out organization that can do things on a big scale it, it would that both demand make demands on the capitalist state and also act you know to overthrow it so i don't think we just say oh we have to either act locally uh, and as anarchists or whatever and then just you know try for work for strictly a reformist way in the in the larger scale mm. You, know, you guys are all making a lot of good points. I'm really honored to be in, in this room with you. <coughs> no, I, I, have, I have some friends, and actually a cousin, who don't have any hope. So they, they, they don't do anything. They're just going to live the best they can, and not, <coughs> they're not worried about it. I, ha I tell them I have to have hope. It's too depressing not to have hope. I'm going to go down fighting. But being an environmentalist since the 60s, uh, I have to say that that's why I said if we don't stop them, if we don't stop the problem, I guess I, I am hoping for some major collapse. These hurricanes and fires aren't, don't seem to be enough to turn the tide. Uh, there's a lecture here. You might want to look him up on the internet. His name, name is Dr. David Pauley. He's the world's greatest authority on oceans. He just spoke up here not too long ago at UC Berkeley. 200 people there. So he gave a good talk. At the end, I said, Dr. Pauley, being being uh, renowned for the ocean, your ocean work, work in the oceans, what, what is your prediction for the future of the oceans? And he said, well, he says, I'm sorry. It's, I'm going to sound a little negative now, because oceans, they absorb uh, carbon dioxide naturally, but they're maxed out, and now they become totally acidified. And he said, within, you know, 70 or 80 years, fish that we take for granted will be rare, and for sure, within 100 years, there'll be no life in the oceans. I mean, those are, that, that, that's, unless we, that, that's a hard one to change as well. So, I still have hope, but... You know, people need to know all this stuff. <laughs> Did you know? Do you know what about the oceans? I didn't uh, know what you just said. I believe you, but I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, you can look him up, Dr. David Pauley. Yeah, I will. He's not the only one who points that What? What did you say? He's not the only one, I'm sure, who points that out. <laughs> no. And it's not the only <laughs> scary thing that's going to kill us all. Right. <laughs> what are the other things? The other this is commentary. He, my favorite. <laughs> he knows that. everything. It's not the only oh, yeah, thing. Commentary knows everything. It, my favorite is that when the ice cap melts, all the energy that's going into melting that ice cap will not be melting the ice anymore. Mm. What happens when your drink, when the ice disappears in your drink? Your drink stays pretty cold until the instant the ice is gone. And it gets very warm very quickly. Mm. And that's what's about to happen. And no one's talking about that. It's going to be a sudden jump, an extra little jump. That won't be exponential, but up and it'll do whatever. Well, on a, on a side note, we're, we're trying to, uh, Mondays, uh, Elka, Karen and I are staffing now. We took over from B a little while ago. And uh, so we're really actually open to have more people come in and give presentations. Not necessarily going to get that quality. Uh, well, you've you got Eric Brooker in this town. Okay, yeah, yeah but there's, a, there's a, we got some local stars. Um, so, um, if anybody wants to put on an event, an event here on a Monday, I mean, it could be any night. You know, Long Hall's got lots of nights, seven of them. But we're really looking for this kind of thing um, and move away from the hangout clubhouse scene that we usually have here, which is nice but not very uh, energizing necessarily. So, um, Feel free to hit us up. If anybody's got, what's that? We're here every Monday night, or, or we give e uh, emails tonight if anybody wants to have a contact. Yeah, the three of us are here every Monday night, so. Or you can come jump by. to the slingshot meeting and, and help out with the paper as well. 
Yeah, slingshots. Right. Slingshots going completely towards electoral politics. It's making a <laughs> radical on. turn. Wait, it's all what? gonna. Be, yeah, because we're we're done with this. Democrat like, or Republican? We're done with riding our bikes around Berkeley and dumpster Democrat diving. Democrat or Republican? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, not totally. I have a question for Seth. Uh, I would like. Well, I guess more, I would like your advice on how not to fuck people over to survive. From from where I'm sitting, I cannot fuck people over to survive. But that means I live in my car, or uh, you know, or I'm doing work trades. And right now, but I and I disagree. I think you do have to fuck people over to thrive in this society. Not to survive, I think you're right, but to thrive, you, there is some level of head stomping that has to take place. And even from my position as like a low level cog in a bigger machine, like if I want to make a living wage, I need to step on my peer's head, either by making him look bad or by making myself appear exceptional. Um, so I'd just like your advice on that. Well, okay, first, you know, um, I wrote that piece, in, in, as much as anything else, as advice to myself, <laughs> dealing with my own contradictions of being in my 20s and being really broke and all the fucked up shit we all did. You know, that was my, that was my attempt to sort that out. Um, one of the things I did find that happened to a lot of us in the Lower East Side in the 1980s is that People really wanted, people really wanted to make it bad, and very often that was actually a self-defeating gesture. Like I remember, we I was in a building and we were organizing a rent strike in the building, and all of the um, we 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 had a wonderful building, and that we had you know tenants who had been. Um, you know, very involved as activists in the 1960s, and the chance to organize against the landlord was just great for them. It was like it was a party; like they really wanted to do this, and they got they were having meetings in the hallway. And I remember I was sitting in the meeting, you know, working, trying to figure out, you know, how to keep the building. And when the meeting was over, and I went into my apartment, my roommate who was another guy the same age as mine, said, what are you doing hanging out with all those old people, Seth? And I was like, uh, we're trying to keep the landlord from throwing us all out. And he's like, Seth, do you actually want to live here? And I'm like, well, yeah, that seems to be what we're doing. He says, Seth, I'm not going to live here. I'm going to be like Picasso and I'm going to live in a penthouse. <laughs> you know, and of course, that guy was gone in a year. But you know, I don't know what became of him. But that was the mentality he had, that he wasn't doing something to take care of himself because he had this notion that he was going to do so well. Um, I also remember that um, there was a particular art dealer um, who, well, you, well, you've heard of Jean-Michel Bessoit, mm. right? Well, there was a year in which John Michel's photograph appeared on the front of the New York Times magazine where he's in this really nice Italian suit sitting next to one of his paintings and he's, I think he's got paint stains on this like extremely expensive Italian suit. So it was like, wow, this guy is making it when he's in his 20s. We could do that. And so people really wanted to get involved with certain galleries that were opening in our neighborhood and we were gentrifying our neighborhood, but artists were really attracted to it. And I got to say, I was too. You know, I went to those same people. And I remember I gave this one gallery um, a bunch of my prints. And there's a gallery called Civilian Warfare that seemed really cool because they operated out of a completely unrenovated storefront that looked like a burnt out building. And you could kind of feel it that the people running it had, were like laundering drug money into art. You could just you could just get the vibe, you know. But we were all really attracted to this. And I remember I gave the guy a bunch of my artwork, and he invited me to a party. And at that party, a man who a man in a very nice suit who claimed to be a famous art dealer uh, sexually assaulted me. Jesus. 
okay? And I don't know if he really was who he claimed to be. And I walked out of there. And then about a month later, the guy who ran the gallery disappeared with everyone's artwork, <laughs> with, disappeared off the face of the earth, and then showed up six months later dead in Europe with, with the mystery disease at that time, which we now all know as AIDS. And when that happened to people, we all kind of looked at each other and said, you know what? We deserve this shit. We deserve to get ripped off because we wanted to get things the easy way. We saw an easy way to get something, and we said, let's take it. You know, there it is. If, it, if they can do it for Jean Michel, they can do it for us. How did you get ripped off? What? Well, they took, they propagated your, your, no, your stuff, No, they right? took everybody's artwork, the guy sold it, <coughs> went to Europe on it, and died. Everybody's work disappeared into this guy's, into this guy's hands, and we all got ripped off. You know, everybody who, who worked with him got ripped off. Is this the image that got propagated? Is that not correct or no? Mm. I mean, that's we didn't go to him they, to propagate you know, to the work. We went to him to get. Oh, yeah, we went to him money, thinking whatever, we'd get paid. Right? That he'd sell them and give you. That part he'd of the sell money. them and we'd make money and we'd be like Jean Michel. Yeah. That's why you. That's why you go to an art dealer. An art dealer is not an info shop. That was an art dealer. <laughs> okay, but the point is that we all thought that we were going to get something. You know, we were young guys in our 20s, we just hit town, we thought, yeah, we can, you know, maybe ne maybe in two years I won't have to be working as an usher in a movie theater. <laughs> you know, it looked really good. You know, and we all got ripped off. And it was humiliating because, you know, it's bad enough to sell out, but then you sell out and you get ripped off on top of it. You know, and it, was like, it, was like, it was a very humiliating experience. We literally, we, we literally got robbed and raped by these people. You know, because we thought that we could get it easy. And so that's what I did that piece in response to, was that environment in New York in the 80s. And I am certainly, you know, not a relative of Jesus Christ, and I can't tell you how to live a perfect life. You know, so right. you're going to have to resolve no, the predictions. I mean, no, know? I guess the more of my advice being like, how do I not feel bad in succeeding in a system that does fuck people over? Oh, okay. Um, wow. Robin Hood. Um, yeah. Well, it's just a balancing act. I, you know, I think it's a question you got to ask yourself every day. It's like, you know, am I, you know, like I've had the problem in the last couple years that I was teaching at School of Visual Arts and there were certain classes where I had to collaborate with the Dean and the Dean was very oppressive to the students and I knew I couldn't change his policies and that I would if I got into a fight with him I'd be thrown I'd lose a job anyways and I finally said okay I'm gonna do fewer classes I'm not gonna deal with this guy because if I work with the, if I work with him, then I'm going to be implicated in things he's doing that I think are un incorrect. You know, so I had to make that decision. I had to make make a sacrifice that you know I'm making less money because I'm only teaching one class a week when I could be teaching two, but I'd be working in a program that was really bad for the students. And I can't. Ch I'm not in a position to change that program, but I can decide how implicated in I want to be. And that's a hard decision because you could e easily make the other decision and say, well, at least if I'm there, I can mitigate that problem. Yeah. And I tried doing that for a few years, and I found out it really didn't work. <laughs> that he didn't. He didn't want the problem mitigated. Right. You know. <laughs> so that was my decision. Yeah. No. In regard to this. My, my father once said to me when I was 20 years old, he said, son, you're going to have to do things that you don't like to do or, or you don't want to really want to do <coughs> to be successful. And that made a lot of sense. Um, in other words, you, you had to make these sacrifices and do things. You, you can't make a living being an athlete or an artist or uh, whatever. Photographer. I mean, very few people make a living at what they really love. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I did kind of make a living, but I, I, I 
I play the game as little as possible. And the problem is when you really, uh, you know, you get tra trapped into the system, the system poisons you. And if you reject the system, then you suffer homelessness or whatever. So it's, it's a two-edged sword. I mean, it's... Uh, <clears throat> You know, we don't. We all don't want to get rich prostituting ourselves. But we want to survive. And I think I have a book that's called "Less Is More," and we just have to have less, and that way we don't have to get poisoned. The thing too, also, is like. Are you gonna say something? Uh, no, 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 not necessary. Go ahead. No, it's, you know, I'm just totally riffing off what you're saying, just because, like, to survive in late stage cap, like. To survive and also to support others to, to survive in late-stage capitalism, you need to be able to, like, have capacity to channel resources. Like, if we're all drowning, nobody can help people get out of the water. So, the thing that I've been trying to think about, too, is just, like, how do we become, like, anchors of resources that we then, like, help, like, channel and support in the ways that we can. And honestly, the other thing, too, is, like, to work, works, work, work, better not like broader like I think that that's something I'm trying to learn because like I, I'm trying to figure out all these different simultaneous crises at the same time and it's important to be aware of them all but like how you're able to not kind of get into a nebulous fog of trying to chase down every single fight and actually focus on like okay there are needs in a specific issue how do I channel there mm -hmm. and then just to remember to be in like a community of folks that have the same values because then people can hold different weights, mm -hmm. like, you know, and, and, and be able to, like, channel and, like, like, corral resources to one thing if needed, like, um, stuff like, like, right now with the migrant caravan and stuff like that, like, folks, yeah, just being able to be smart about it and just to remember that community is, like, kind of the bedrock that can, can keep the things going on, because people can hold labor, emotional labor, to think about it if, if some people just need to, like, tap out, because, like, yeah, we need to survive these movements. Like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. I found I like the groups I like to work with were groups that had sort of concrete, attainable goals where you would know whether you succeeded or not. <laughs> like, you know, with the squatters movement, you know, we knew we were renovating a certain number of buildings, we were trying to get them, and that every, that you, every tactic that was used could be evaluated on its efficacy for getting those buildings, you know, and that could include legal tactics, illegal tactics, civil disobedience, you know, whatever it is you used, that it was measured against getting a certain thing to happen. I found ACT UP in the 80s was similar to that, that they would want specific legislation that would have a direct effect on people with HIV. And they would say, okay, who's the guy who can determine that we're going to his house, we're affecting him for this specific thing. And you'd know whether or not you obtained it. Um, or a group that I'm working with now, Sane Energy, in New York State, are against fossil fuel infrastructure. And they can say, okay, we want to prevent this liquefied natural gas built plant from being built and we want a wind farm built there instead. And you can measure that and you can choose what you're going to do based on here's a thing that we could actually do that I feel like sometimes if you have too big <coughs> or broad a goal then you don't even know whether you're being effective towards that goal because it's so far off. Yeah. You know that you know that it becomes kind of abstract and for me that's how my mind works that's what I'm comfortable being part of. Um, you know, and I, I think, I mean, there's a role for other things, too, but that that has made sense to me in life, is, you know, um, having clear, measurable goals, even if they're smaller, you know, like, like, like when we, when Eric and I were, like, first time, we're going to do something against Reagan, we pretty quickly found that, what the fuck are we doing? You know, we, we're not going to determine whether Reagan is president of the United States. Give me a break. We, we're not. It, it, nobody asked us, you know. You know. <laughs> I mean, but there were things we could do that were very immediate, and that people responded to that because they knew they could get something out of it. Yes. So, did you vote? 
Did you vote in that election, Reagan? You know? Did I vote? I voted a number of times. You voted for Reagan. I mean, did you really vote for Reagan? <laughs> did you vote for Reagan? No, of course I didn't. Well, that's what I voted for. Did you vote for Mondale? You voted for Nixon. Um, <laughs> Do you, you want me to go over my voting history? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that happens in a, in a, in a booth with a curtain around it for a reason. Did you support did you Bernie? Did you support I definitely Bernie? supported Bernie. You supported Bernie. And I, and I got a lot of shit from my Green Party friends for supporting Bernie, hmm. who were then really upset about Bernie not, uh, about, you know, the ways in which the Clinton campaign undermined Bernie. But um, when he was running, they weren't supporting him. That's what I remember, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thought Bernie would, I think guys like Bernie Sanders and Dennis Kucinich are about the best things the system can put, can put in place. Elizabeth They're about Warren. the best we can get out of them. Elizabeth Warren. You know, I, I, Dennis Kucinich was a great man. Dennis really Kucinich is a great man. You know, he's, he's a really <coughs> underrated person. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, too. I don't, I don't know on. much about her. No, there's problems with everybody, but yeah, she's what like, what's the Ralph Nader. Nader. What? Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader, um, I understand why he did what he did. Uh, because, you know, he was saying that, um, that the, um, you know, the WTO and NAFTA and all the trade agreements undermined all of the legislation he'd worked all his life to put in, right? right? All point. of his, all of his community groups, they put in, you know, rules on automobile safety and rules on workplace safety, and and then these trade, the Democrats signed these trade agreements that completely blow that out of the water, and so he's like, wait a second, we can't go along with this, That's right? You know, and so he came with what I don't think was a very effective tactic to protest that, which was to run for office himself which I probably think was a mistake, um, but he was essentially right, and that in a lot of ways, like, the rise of Trump is because of the failure to deal with globalization. Did you vote for Nader? <laughs> did I vote for Nader? No, I didn't. No, I did you know, But I, I do understand why he did that, you know, and I respect him, and I, I think he was painted into a corner, and in fact, he was calling attention to what had happened in the American system that eventually became what Trump was running on. You know, I mean, Trump essentially took, <laughs> yeah. took his entire platform, yeah. the, or a big piece of his platform, from the left in terms of places like Ohio, where I grew up, you know, and so I know some of that, and places like Detroit, you know. He was running on the left-wing platform, which was that we have to do something to protect jobs here by no. keeping the, co the corporations from being able to move money anywhere they want. Grew up in Ohio. It's not really a left-wing you know? platform. It's We're in Ohio. Ohio. That's a left nationalist platform. Or, well, the way, he, the way he articulated it. No, but I, I the whole idea of focusing on keeping <laughs> jobs here is pitting the U.S. workers against the workers in other countries who are even worse off. That's not yeah, a left-wing thing. Yeah, but, but the point is that the trade agreements that were made made it impossible to enforce minimum wage laws, made it impossible to do a lot of things. Yeah, but that's not the aspect of the trade that Trump was running around against. He was, he was running against the, uh, you know, in a purely protectionist uh, way. He's not running against the parts, of, the parts of the agreements that were the real problem, which was the ones that gave corporations all kinds of power to sue. The states. That was a totally different aspect of it. That okay. was showed, in, showed into the trade agreement. You know, basically it was concealed under free trade. But so Trump was. I don't know if you know this, but Trump was lying. Yeah, of course right. Trump was lying. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, in a way, I agree with you. In a way, I don't. Yeah. Um, if you go over the history of the. Uh, 1912 uh, so-called Dred and Roses strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Yes. Um, the um, at the they revealed the child labor practices of textile companies. Yes. And Congress made child labor illegal. Yeah. And their 
justification in that pre-New Deal period for being able to do that yeah. was, well, we're already protecting these companies from foreign trade with tariffs. So they have got to do something. They have to reciprocate in some way by uh, not using child labor. And that was, that was what made it legitimate to them to do that. Well, we don't have to reinforce that kind of political ideology. Okay, all right. But I'm just saying that there is a connection between these things. There's a historic connection between those two things. You know, and that, that the WTO and NAFTA and all those things undermine a lot. You know, and that, you know, the Democrats very much signed their name to all of that. And that was a big part of it. Allowed Trump to come in. Yeah, but it, basically, I don't think the left should get involved in uh, in any way in promoting the idea that we have to protect um, American standards of living, American workers versus you know comparison to the rest of the world. Um, and I think we have to, first of all, we have to make our main focus, I think, uh, fight fight against U.S. imperialism and um, economically as well as you know, obviously military. So does that mean that we don't have any position on people losing their jobs in Detroit? Well, there are various demands we can make. I mean, go back to the transitional program, 1938, uh, you know, of, uh, you know um, lowering out, cutting hours of work to make well, I'm not getting very, my own told words at this hour, but basically, um, we should never go along with the, the whole idea of creating jobs. We should really be, treat jobs as as either either doing something useful, in which case people should be should have those jobs, or do, or doing things that are useless or harmful, which should, and those jobs should not exist. And we should take the ad, you know, we, Okay. In other words, we should reinforce. We should not reinforce the idea that we have to create more spaces for people to sell their labor power in order to survive. Okay. All right. I, that's a good point. Yeah. A good idea. If you need to. And there's no easy. We have to deal with the fact that we have to go against the special interests of U.S. workers if we're internationalists no, no. and, and leftists. Um, well, it seems like objectively we are already. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you give a presentation at the uh, Howard Zinn Festival? Yes, I did. And, but you said you were turned off. No, no, I, no. I, 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 last year, I, I was exaggerating. What, what I was, I was basically complimenting this crowd because the discussion we're having right now was much better and stronger than the discussion I had after my show there. That's all. I, I, I love the Howard Zinn Festival. I don't want to put down the Howard Zinn Festival. Yeah. Yeah, because Bill Ayers and Dean Dorn were there last year, and Ford mm. Churchill, they, they get a lot of good people. Yeah, and Absolutely. good activists. Absolutely. But you're, Absolutely. You're, you're yeah, audience, and a lot I of us all back. know each other here, too, I, so I, you're probably cluing into the yeah. fact that we're a I, I'm, I'm taking that back. You are correct. I stand corrected. I should not have said that. I was just it. saying that, <laughs> you know, this the was people a great came to your talk, group of people. The people that came to your talk, they, they didn't have a... Good questions or something. Yeah, that was that it, or they didn't the interact. The interaction. The, inter the, uh, the interaction oh, here is really great. Uh, where in Ohio are you from? Cleveland. Okay. I'm from Indiana. Neighbors. Shaker Heights. Cleveland Heights. Shaker Heights. Not Shaker Heights. Well, You're, from Cleveland 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 Heights. Okay. You're from Cleveland Heights. Yeah. My brother lives there. He just he gave up this other house. Dumped it back to the bank. Did you, did you find did you, get, you got totally. Where'd you go to school? Um, Heights High. Where? Heights High in Roxborough. Cleveland Heights High. Did you go to college? Oh, college. Um, I went to NYU for one year, dropped out. Um, I went to Pratt Institute part time and got told to get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. um, I am. I do not have a college degree, but I teach at School of Visual Arts, so there. But living in New York, <laughs> been li coming from Ohio, been living in New York changed your life. Um, Just being around New Yorkers, it changed my life. Um, I would say that growing up in Cleveland Heights, uh, there was a moment 
you know, like in my last year of high school, I like tried like LSD and meditation and a lot of things to try to change my consciousness. And then I was walking down the street and I was looking at a particular tree and realizing that was the tree where kids used to beat the shit out of me. And I said, you know what would change my consciousness? Never seeing that tree again. And so I went to New York. <laughs> and that changed my consciousness a lot. But in New York, you meet a lot of interesting people. Right? Yeah. But yeah, I, I would say, actually, not so much being in New York, but when I dropped out of school and I had to find an affordable place and I found a cheap place in the Lower East Side, and then I was no longer a college student living in a dorm, but I was a person living in a community with neighbors, with a sense of obligation to the people around me, a sense that I had to explain myself to them. Um, it's probably one of the reasons that I um, did not do a lot of drugs that my friends were doing because my neighbors were really freaked out about the drug dealing that was going on on the block that affected them negatively because, you know, it meant a criminal operation was right in their doorway. You know, it affected me a lot to be in a neighborhood and have neighbors, you know, in a real way, in a way that I don't think we did when I was growing up in the suburbs in Cleveland Heights, frankly, that I don't think my father had any civic engagement with the people in Cleveland Heights the way I did with the people on my block in Lower East Side. It just wasn't part of a suburban consciousness to do that the way it is a place, a, a, a long-standing inner-city neighborhood where people have connections to each other. Just one more question. I asked too many questions, but how did you get started in this work? On, on the magazine? Okay. Yeah, by writing it. Um, we started the magazine in 1979. I guess I, how, how did you become an activist, too? And, and how did I become an activist? Yeah, and, and then, then turn to this. Um, oh, how did I become an activist? Wait, didn't you used to run the How I Became an Activist series? Yeah, 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 yeah. I always ask that question. Um, <laughs> did you have a mentor? Wow. Um, mentor experiences? I, I think what, what caused me to become politically activist um, was um, um, the Iran hostage crisis because when I'd been in college I knew a lot of Iranian kids um, and in the dorm I lived in there were there were monarchists there were socialists there were there was one Khomeini guy you know, the, every faction of Iran had sent their kids to school to get them away from the mess that was going on there. So I, I knew Iranian kids. And um, then a few years later, when um, the Iranians took hostages in the American embassy, I understood that they had to do that because they were afraid the Americans would overthrow the government and the only way to do it was to hold, the, hold was to move on the embassy immediately, and that the real government was the embassy, not their government, well. right? And and that was something Iranians understood very well. That all the kids I met understood that, um, except the monarchist guy, who every all the other kids hated anyway. But um, you know, um, so I understood that, and when I saw. Um, the way Americans were being mobilized about the Iran hostage crisis that in the grocery store that I went to through my entire childhood, they were selling these buttons that were this big that had, they said, fuck Iran. And I was like, these are the people who would slap me when I was a kid if I said fuck. And they're wearing this button that says fuck Iran, and they don't know jack shit about Iran. They've never heard of this place until the hostages were taken. And I said, okay, if all of these people feel they have the right to express a point of view, then I have a right to express a point of view. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I have a little bit of information, and I should get involved. And then, you know, I gradually got more involved. We had a peace group in uh, Pratt where I was studying part-time of five people because that was, you know, 1979, 1980, and politics was uncool, totally uncool at that time, you know, and so we seemed really <coughs> weird, and then we had, like I said, the tenants union in my building, which really showed me that there was a type of politics that was actually practically useful to people, 
mm -hmm. that it I actually benefited from the activity of this group, and I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know, um, and um, you know, so that was where. I developed politically to be an activist was from those experiences. Um, I think that I probably, you know, by being a person who was a bit isolated when I was growing up and bullied when I was growing up, that probably gave me a state of mind where I felt that there was injustice in the world and I should do something about it. But that could have easily made me a right wing person. There are right wing people with that background too, you know. Um, but it made me feel that I ought to do something in the world, you know. Uh, two questions. You think if uh, you hadn't gotten burned in the art deal, do you think you'd have gone the Jean-Michel route? Or is that too high? I, I don't think that that route was really open to us. I think that was a lie that we were told. Yeah. I think I think a whole bunch of young people in the 80s in the Lower East Side were lied to. That there was, and that's one of the continuous lies in American society. There's always some get-rich-quick plan. There's always some way that you're going to make it. It's like the lottery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know. Was it something that you wanted? Shall we say? <laughs> well, well, let me put it this way. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was. You know, material. I wanted to be able to say I make a living doing this stuff. I didn't want to have to. You know, I didn't particularly like, you know, <coughs> working in a moving company or working as a foot messenger in, you know, the December job. cold. I didn't like that. But more importantly, I want, of course, I wanted to be able to say to my mother, to my father, to my sister, look, this wasn't some stupid thing I did. This actually works. Right. You know, I'm a real person. Yes. Right. You know, so yeah, that was very attractive. It was a very attractive idea. You know, um, but you know, that's not something that comes easily. You know, right. you got to accept that that it's it's not easy to get make a living as an artist. Right. You know, if you want to be an artist, you know, you got to pay your dues. Right. And, and I think that one of the aspects of the gentrification of the Lower East Side was this myth that, you know, a 20-year-old kid becomes world-famous right. artist. And everybody I know, right. I mean, I'd like to say I saw through that. I'd like to say it, but it's not true. Right. I only saw through that when it hit me in the face, that it really right. didn't work that way. So what happened? Then? You know, of course it was attractive. How could it not be attractive? <laughs> what was your second question? Oh, yeah, well, that's interesting because, you know, talking to you and having been acquainted with you for a while, you come across like it's you know, you know, but John Michel, whoever, he's become, represents millions, or like millions, as this gentleman, I think, said, and others, is certainly you could be a working class artist, right? Mm -hmm. If one is not greedy, and maybe that's the problem. I mean, millions, I mean, does, do these people need all that money? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other question was, uh, I, I knew Ohio, I didn't know, I think I knew Cleveland. What, uh, what do you make of Harvey Pecker? Harvey Pekar, I knew Harvey Pekar when I was growing up. He, um, who is he? Isn't, isn't as big Comic a deal as it sounds Comic because comic fandom... He doesn't know who he is. Oh, Har okay, Harvey Pekar was this guy who, he, he was a working class intellectual. He worked at a, a VA hospital. Um, and uh, he wrote um, he wrote jazz criticism, um, but he was good friends with a lot of the underground comic book artists, including Robert Crumb, who was originally a Cleveland boy. And Harvey, he, um, when I met him, he was a very depressed man. Um, his first wife had committed suicide, which is interestingly something he's never written about. What year? Um, I met him in the 70s. Oh, wow when I was a kid, because comic book fandom in the 70s was very small, so I knew people all over New York who were comic book fans, because right. Peter Cooper and I were huge comic book fans. Right. It was all we thought about. Mm -hmm. And we met this guy named Harvey P. Carr. Like, a kid said, I want to introduce you to my friend Harvey Pecker. He has a lot of cool comics. And <coughs> we'd go over to Harvey P. Carr's house and he'd show us underground comics that we weren't illegally allowed to read, mm -hmm. um, which made my parents very suspicious of this man. But anyways, at a certain point, Harvey decides that he's going to write comic books about working class life in Cleveland. 
about his life, not so much about working class life, about his life, and about how boring his life is. Uh, and that really was the subject of his comics. And he had enough friends who were underground comic artists that he could hire them to illustrate his stories. And he would, he would, he would hire these guys, print it himself. It was called American Splendor Comics. He would come out with one issue a year. And he would say, yeah, it costs less than buying a new car, you know? Um, and he printed this comic book, and it completely changed a lot of ideas about comics in the United States, where he was sort of the first guy to say, you don't have to do some amazing far out thing. You can talk about everyday life in this medium. It wasn't yeah. about superheroes or wars. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it was just about, it was, it was like, you know, a Harvey Peacock comic could be called uh, The Terror of Waking Up to a New Day. And then he could do a sequel called The Terror of Waking Up to Yet Another Day. You know, he would do things like this. You know, they were kind of, they had a kind of humor to them and a kind of really deep pessimism and cynicism about, you know, my life sucks. You know, my job sucks. You know, nothing happened this weekend. Things like this, you know. And they were kind of dark, but in a way had a kind of humor. And um, he completely changed comics. It, it, we started to call this the autobiographical comic. But yeah, like I, I knew him when I was a kid. Like and I think, he, I think the fact that he did that had a big effect on me. Cool. You know, and um, yeah, I, I think Harvey P. Carr uh, is one of the more important people in American comic books. Anybody else that um, stands out? Vaughn Bodie had a big effect on me. Um, he was a big hero for me. I, I met him personally when I was a kid. Jeff Jones uh, was a. Um, Who's Jeff Jones? He, he, um, they were both science fiction comic book artists. Cool. But they were, you know, actually both Vaughn Bodie and Jeff Jones were what we now call transsexual. But yeah, right, they, right. They, they didn't use that word then. You know, but like. Jeff looked an awful lot like Jeff and Vaughn both drew very beautiful women and they both looked like them. That's great. You know. Um, but um, they they were like really outside of the box people within the comic book world and they had a big effect on me. Yeah, Vaughn Bode influenced a lot of the graffiti. Yeah, artists. he did. A lot of the graffiti art, like the lizards that are in all the graffiti art, those are Vaughn Bodie's lizards. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Bodie's son did a mural in West Oakland. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. Part. I heard about Yeah, I heard about that, yeah. Like a half a block long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bodie's son has kind of picked up where, tried to pick up where Vaughn left off, if that's at all possible in the modern world. But, um, you know, because Vaughn died young and <coughs> left a lot of stuff unfinished and had a lot of you know, sketches and studies and concepts written on paper that had never been realized. Um, and, you know, I've thought about this a lot, that if Vaughn had been in a more accepting world, maybe he wouldn't have died that young. It's, it's never been clear whether that was a suicide or an accident. But even if it was an accident, he was fucking around with some things that could have killed him. And why was he doing that? Because the world hadn't accepted him for who he was, you know. So, um, you know, and, and then Jeff became transsexual in his old age. Nobody knew that about Jeff, although Jeff always looked like the women in his paintings. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, the Bay Area definitely had like a strong transsexual era around that time in the 70s with the Cockettes. Mm -hmm. like, and, and, and Vaughn was the guy who came out to the West Coast, whereas most of the cartoon activity was on the East Coast, except for the undergrounds. And but most of the science fiction art was on the East Coast, you know. And 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 Vaughn came out here, and it was a big deal for him, and he was very much part of the counterculture here. I very much like uh, Skip Williamson, which I think is from Chicago. Mm -hmm. A very blatant revolutionary, kill the cops, blow shit up kind of. Mm -hmm. The, kind the of storyline <coughs> stuff, but it's hard to find his stuff. He, Skip Williamson. I don't know if I know his work. Uh, work for the Seed, I think. Sometimes some of his arts in the uh, Jerry Rubin's books or Abby Hoffman's books, stuff like wow. that. Wow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then I did see that work because I saw those books. Um, the guy who really blew my mind when I was a teenager was, of course, um, 
Spain Rodriguez. Yeah. Because like yeah. Spain Rodriguez was the first did the first comics where the cops were the bad guys, <laughs> and they were also the first comics where they like showed sex as opposed to implying sex. Oh, there is sex. That's what it looks like. You know. Well, he's known for unleashing the id upon people like Robert Crumb. Um, like the subconscious, so then people can kind of put out their kind of... I'm not the big Crumb fan that other people are, but I understand. He drew really well, and I understand why people love him. You know, I, I was much more affected by Spain Rodriguez, I would say. How about S. Clay Wilson? S. Clay Wilson was horrifying. <laughs> the, the, the brilliant. Yeah, he's brilliant and horrifying. You know, I mean, even as a kid, I was like completely horrified by S. Clay Wilson. You know, he's so violent. But, y you know, it was a, yeah, you know, it was releasing a lot of stuff, sure. But I would say the underground person I'm most affected by would be uh, Von Bodhi and, um, Spain and Spain Rodriguez. Yeah. And I also like George Metzger, who nobody remembers. Yeah. Right, I thought George Metzger was really interesting. Ron Cobb's pretty cool. Who? R. Cobb, C O B B. Oh, what did he do? He did single panel comics, usually a dystopian imagery. What time for? LA Free Press, a lot of stuff. Mm. He later went on to do Hollywood art, uh, art for Hollywood. You know more about this than I do. I, yeah, I, I get <laughs> what time for? 60s? Oh, uh, yeah, um, mid 60s. He, he's, like, he's another person that worked for Disney and then went from the Disney to the movie. Ma Moscoso is a genius. I don't know that he affected my work much, but Moscoso is a genius. An absolute genius. What's his first name again? <coughs> Victor Moscoso. Victor, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean... He was like a... a he, was he also both did a, posters he, he, both, he both developed psychedelic posters yeah. and also did these very psychedelic comics that kind of went nowhere but were like formally really interesting. You know. So, I guess... What else? <laughs> were, you part of, were you part of the Occupy movement? In New York? Um, I was not as much a part of the Occupy movement as I should have been. I went down there the, the first weekend. I, I didn't believe it would be as effective as it was, and I probably could, should have put more into it. I was a bit cynical, and it, it definitely notified me that the, the story was not over. So it was very inspiring, but I was not as involved as I could have been. You know, I did do one comic strip about it, and I did. Um, I was there the first couple nights, and I actually was really surprised that it lasted longer than that. I, I left assuming, oh, they'll be arrested any any minute, and they lasted a, a couple months. So I, I was. Uh, they taught me a lesson there, <laughs> you know that that you know. I mean, my assumption because I lived through Giuliani in New York, and Giuliani just made it illegal to step off the curve, you know. And there were a few years where you could get arrested for fucking anything, you know. And I, like a lot of people, I just assumed that was the future of New York that it was always going to be like that, and actually, no, that was a very temporary thing that Giuliani did to facilitate the, ge the gentrification of New York, but it was not sustainable. You know, you can't run a society like that. You know, you can't arrest, you can't hold people in jail overnight for jaywalking, which he did. The people went, people had, were arrested and went to jail overnight for jaywalking under Giuliani. It was completely yeah. crazy. You know, and eventually that had to stop. There, it, that was unsustainable. And so, you know, a number of us were very surprised that you know, older people in New York were very surprised that Occupy was as successful as it was. You know, it was very, it was very successful here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very fascinating here. There would be like, uh, they would clear out the encampment and then like uh, people would converge and then tear down the fences and just start up the camp the next day. It was rebuilt. But we, it lasted about four months here, mm -hmm. and it was a great, it was a great hangout. It was, a, it was a place to well, go. Well, it also ushered in people doing other direct actions on banks and kind of <laughs> building occupations. And there, uh, since then, there's been more, what, much more vivid uh, uh, public uh, encampments going on, mm -hmm. where people are just blatantly setting up encampments uh, in public spaces. And I think that's probably off of Occupy. Like, it educated a lot. Of, it educated a lot of people. People came for different reasons. Students for student loan, people for foreclosure problems. Some people, they, they, never, they never had been activists before, mm -hmm. but they had a place to congregate, hang out, and they learned from each other. And a lot of them left with the idea of system, we need system change. Mm -hmm. yeah. and they're, and they're well, out. there's the spokes cancels where people would come and 
and there would be these long meetings where people probably were the first time they encountered uh, all these ideas in, uh, coming from people in their own community. Are you familiar with Rachel Shragas? She helped visualize the, um, basically the, during Occupy Wall Street they created like a list of demands and it's like this really intricate mind map that has all the different listings. I didn't understand what you said. Rachel Shragas, she's like an arts activist. Out Rachel, of oh I love Rachel. Yeah, I'm friends with her. Yeah, we. Oh, yeah. We Ra Rachel's stuff. awesome. You know, I mean, R Rachel has done a lot to. Um, Rachel has done a lot <coughs> to people in my position of getting political organizations to recognize that they occasionally need to pay the artists who do their banners. Mm -hmm. Yes. She has done a lot on that. But like, yeah. like, uh, nobody. You know, I never really had the balls to go up to these guys and say, you know, you really ought to pay me for this. You gotta pay. Yeah. But she went and did that for all these artists and. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't thank Rachel enough She's because, dope. you know, because of Rachel, even more than David Solna, you know, I can actually get paid occasionally for painting a banner. <laughs> yeah, you know, Rachel's which is, used to be something that we all did as volunteer work, you know, which you can do a certain amount of that, but Sustainability. Um, it really makes a difference in the amount of time you can put into something and the amount of the, the materials you can buy and the, the space you can use to do something if you can occasionally get compensated for it. And she's made that happen. She also does this really amazing thing with these sort of moving strips. Did you see those? Yeah, I, perf I perform with that scroll all the time. Yeah, yeah she, she left one here with me for the West Coast. The, the, the one I saw was the one about Puerto Rico. Did you see that? That one I haven't seen yet. That's I'm super amazing. stoked about it. Whoa. That, I, that was like hypnotizing. It's a powerful the, the, the whole room, she has this basically a comic strip on a little piece of paper, yes. a very small, but a very long piece of paper, mm -hmm. really long, <laughs> and people stand around in a circle, and they pass it to each other, <laughs> and, and they watch it while somebody is playing music. Yes. And it's just hypnotizing because you're watching a film, <laughs> but the film is being run on the people power of the people it's in the world. Tactile. And you're all involved in that. You know, it, it's like watching a movie or like watching a video, or, except, you know, it's entirely human run. It's entirely human power. How, how long does one of these pieces last? Like, how long are you? I think when I when I saw it, it was like forty minutes. It was really long. <laughs> wow! Oh my God. No. No. Puerto Rico's is not forty minutes. The scroll that I have is like fifteen minutes. Like uh, just okay, I you know, it seemed it. like it's still it, that's still that's it, still it was like, okay, it was amazingly it, long. It's powerful. Well, the one that I have is actually canvas. No, no, I think I think I think the Puerto Rico one. On she paper. had a lot more people working with her, and it was her biggest project. She told me that. Yeah. She had like. 20 artists working with her on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a yeah. deep effort. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, How come it doesn't rip? Graphene. What? How come it doesn't rip? Yeah, because people rip. are very careful with it. That's the whole point. Whoa. <laughs> it, you are involved in making this thing work. And you have to trust that everyone around you is involved in making it work. So, so it, it gives it a completely different meaning than wow. watching film and it just goes by you and somebody else put it up there. You know, it's brilliant. It's Rachel's brilliant. She's really important. If I could important. segue from art back to politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> some of the first uh, political meetings, community meetings I ever went to was for People's Park, which was happening around the same time as the um, mm -hmm. uh, Thompson Square riots yeah. were happening. Um, and currently there's a lot of fear and dread and anxiety about uh, developers devel building on top of the park uh, currently. And um, it, uh, I would segue away that with something I heard on the radio that's pretty interesting, which is about um, a critique about 2009, 2010 criticism of Obama contribution to being president, mm -hmm. which uh, was kind of a critique about whiteness, which is like white people, when they want change, they want change immediately. Whereas the black community often knows that like change comes over time and, and takes a long time to develop and to actually make effective change. Um, I think the park is really fascinating because it, it from my studies, it, it synthesizes a lot of what's happening uh, with America as a superpower, um, also with the world culture, with industrialization, like a kind of like um, televisions and affluency and kind of capitalism and shit like that. 
So I, th I think people were kind of like trying to work out like things like being against the war or, or sexuality or uh, racial segregation and also disenfranchisement from nature. Mm -hmm. And they kind of put it into the park and kind of made it into a people's park. I'm not sure about the comic book store, but made it into like a kind of like a direct action kind of thing. So, I mean, I kind of came into this as a teenager and like, so seeing the park, it just took it for granted. It's, it's cool. It's just part of what makes Berkeley cool and stuff like that. And um, I, can, I can understand why a lot of people today just see it as a kind of like, I don't know if you went by there while you're in town, but a lot of people's criticism of it is it's just it's degenerate. It's not, it's, it's not as relevant as most people consider the 60s and stuff like that. Even though a lot of the same issues are still relevant today. We're still disenfranchised from nature. We're still like uh, sexually repressed. We still have racial segregation. We still have uh, a ridiculously enclosed, uh, imposed class system. There's like, like I think a lot of the issues are still relevant today, mm -hmm. and it's, we, we've lost the, the ability to be articulate to get more people to be kind of see the synthesis of issues right. that are in t entailed with the park. Um, so, is there an attempt now to evict people's park? Or they want to de develop on it to start building on it, and they're using this thing where they want to build housing. So it's like maybe the same thing where they like, same uh, thing they used on uh, Adam Purple affordable housing as yeah. what. Do you think um, you could think of a phrase you could use? It's a joke. So you're to say. It's our fucking uh, our fucking car. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, like that's because that's what they like to build everywhere, right? Is affordable housing, right? Yeah, that's um, you know, but I, that was that was the same dynamic with Adam Purple's garden in the '80s. Uh, yeah. This, you know, older hippie guy had built this. Taken this vacant lot and made this garden um, in the Lower East Side. In the Lower East Side, um, using you know human shit, and he made the point of that, oh, that that's what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That I'm I'm recycling waste the way the city ought to be doing it, yeah, yeah. rather than putting it in the water. And he'd grown this garden there on a vacant lot. And what the city did is they said, oh well, we want to build. I think it was a housing project for for people with hearing disabilities. <laughs> And, you know, something that was completely admirable. But the thing is that there was this huge area, um, which is called, uh, gets called Seward Park. It wasn't a park. But it was an area where they demolished, in the 60s, they demolished rows and rows of tenement housing, saying they would rebuild it, and then not rebuild anything there. And it was kept, it, it was a huge area, and it was kept empty, and it's still not rebuilt on that area. Wow. And so, while they were saying, we're going to build housing on this guy's garden, and essentially creating all of this stir in the community between different factions, they were sitting on empty land, and the motivation for them sitting on it was Sheldon Silver, who was the most powerful person in the New York State Senate, the most powerful Democrat. Um, was elected in a district where, for him to get elected, he needed a Jewish majority in that district. And that, if you built affordable housing there, it, we, we were no longer in a time when public housing was going to be filled with Jewish families. And he knew that. And so he just blocked that for basically a generation. The, that land stayed empty while all this other these fights happened. and. I would say if you're being faced with that where people are saying, oh, well, this is a place we can build affordable housing, find out where else they're not building affordable housing and really make a point of that. Well, there's a lot of empty storefronts. There's like a lot of like vacant commercial spaces that are affordable. What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, 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 well they, they've manipulated that word all over the map, sure. Yeah. I, it's like they, once they lose all the site, they get something on it, these factors, and it fills up. That's why the parks are empty space. There's no buildings on them. Once they put buildings on them, they're whatever, whoever controls the buildings decide to do with it, right? Well, I, I, I would just like, uh, want to piggyback on a thought that um, I felt a little discomfort about uh, the hyper people in our scene talking about climate. And I, I feel like there's just some general. Uh, 20th century malaise where people are just so disenfranchised from nature that everything has to be in a, gl in a glass or separate and it's just like we've we've as a human species have been separated from 
a relation to nature. Like fire is illegal in California, more or less. You, like it's like you'll be fined for having polluting the environment, although you can fucking drive your car anywhere or whatever, right? So it's like a lot of the things that were essential for people's survival amongst nature, with nature, is outlawed or be strange from them. And I think that's, we're just getting, getting pushed more in that direction. I think the park kind of like, is in some ways a kind of window into the world where we used to be. I, I, I hang out with these guys during Funat Bombs at the park, and I realize the centuries of tradition that happens there, where you get your food collectively, and you cook it collectively, and you serve it collectively, and you eat outside, not in some fucking restaurant, under lights or whatever, but you see every, everybody, your friends and your enemies, and you're just <laughs> eating the food that's the bounties of the earth and stuff like that. Well, yeah, there, I mean, the history of environmentalism in the United States is that it was actually originally a movement that came out of the far right, that it came out of, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and the, the original parks were made very often by displacing um, Native American people who lived in that land. And, you know, that it's a, been a real struggle, I think, um, and other people can speak to this better than I can because I'm not that ex deep in the environmental movement. I'm pretty recent to it, but my sense is that there was a real struggle with people who saw conservationism f in, in a right-wing framework where they wanted to, um, say, prevent immigration to the United States because it would mean there'd be more people taking up more land. There, you know, people involved in environmentalism who said that, you know. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, um, you know, so I, I think that, you know, it's something that has to be thought about in a complex way, you know. Um, you know, my impression, and again, I wasn't involved with her, but my impression is that Judy Berry was very significant in making environmentalism a left-wing movement within this country. She was a Marxist. What? She was a Marxist. Marxist. Yeah. yeah. But she could talk to rednecks. I, I didn't know she was a Marxist, issues. but it makes sense. She, wrote, she wrote a long article about her. Her, her parents were left-wingers in Baltimore. I've been a Earth researcher since the late 80s. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> in 1989, before the bombing, mm. she gave a talk out in Molinas, California, on the mm -hmm. coast, in the community center, and there were about 50, 60 people there. And <clears throat> she, she asked people if they knew much about, you know, the environmental movement and what they were, she was trying to do, and her first was trying to do, and saving the, the, the redwoods. And about half the audience didn't know the whole story, so she started telling it. And the more she told the story, the, the room was really, the lighting was very dim. And the more she told that story, she just sounded like Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, the way she, she had set fire. She just had that charisma. The more she told that story, the room kind of lit up for me. And I says, wow, <laughs> I got to get involved with this. But it was her words and her charisma, she just had it. And when she called a rally, what? That's why she had to get blown up. Yes, when she called a rally, not 100 would come, not 300, thousands would come. We had one time 1,200 people get arrested in one day. And, and she had that kind of charisma to draw people. Mm -hmm. It's too bad that uh, movements need sometimes one person to do that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but she was the one, and we saved six thousand acres of redwood trees <coughs> over twenty years. We had fifty people living in trees. Direct action. It was it was the best. Mm -hmm. And, and one I thing one, th one thing about Earth First and, and, and that whole experience is that no matter what our differences were, uh, you know, in other words, and there were differences. Uh, we the cause outweighed our differences, so we learned to live with problematic people. And if they're really bad, we had to get rid of them. But we learned to live with differences. 
and that was a, that was really good experience. And that sort of speaks to what you were saying about having a specific goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, this is very specific. Yeah, some yeah, of these yeah. actions. It wasn't like let's save all the force in the world, and how are we going to talk to well, everyone yeah. about that? All well, it's like all the socialist groups. They're always criticizing each other and and, and competing against each other. Oh, and, anarchists too. Well, this yeah, is yeah. <laughs> and, and the point is, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> we have to forget our differences. Called circling the wagon, them. circling the wagons, and shooting them. inward. Yeah, right. Transcend them to no, focus on a cause. I, uh, you know, the cause I'm mad. The difference. I, I just yeah. wanted to add this: that I met a lot of people, young people in the '90s, who had been part of Redwood Summer, and they would come back to New York, having been part of Redwood Summer, and they would have learned all this tactic you know, with the lock boxes and the tree sits and stuff, and they became part of particularly the movement to prevent Giuliani from selling off New York's community gardens, which he tried to get rid of. He tried to auction off all the community gardens in New York. Mm -hmm. he, li and he literally tried to... to and you know, he failed. Yeah, he failed. But part of the reason he failed was all these kids who'd been part of Earth First, mm -hmm. who came back with a lot of tactic and a real political mm -hmm. education and um, a different sense of how civil disobedience worked than New York activists had. And they became a very big part of um, saving the community gardens, saving ABC No Rio Community Center. Um, one of the people in, who was one of the people in that group was Brad Will. I don't know if people here knew Brad. Yeah, yeah. 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 He was murdered. You know, he was um, and I remember um, that I remember Brad Will like grabbing me when I'm walking up the street and saying, "Okay, you got to come with me. You got to come with me." And we, he took me to this community garden where people were doing a memorial for David Chain, right? Um, who'd been killed in the Redwoods. And I remember Brad Will, who was a teenager. I mean, maybe he was 20. Maybe he was 20. And he got up and he said, "Well." You know, it really sucks that David Shane died because he was my friend, but we all knew that we could expect that to happen, and we should continue doing exactly what we have been doing. And I was just blown away by that because the people I worked with, you know, if, if there had been a death in the squatter movement in the 1980s, if, if somebody had been killed in an action, there would have been hysteria. I just know how the people, and people would have pointed fingers at each other, and people would have lost it, you know. And I was like, wow, something's going on over there with Earth First, that these young guys are coming back, and, and young women are coming back with this kind of mentality, that this is a real militant mentality, that they were able to look at that calmly and dispassionately and accept that, this is a, that they, they were ready to die for these trees. You know, and I was, unfortunately, that kind of does predict what happened to Brad, but he took a lot of risks, and some of them I wish he hadn't taken, you know, but um, I know that, you know, we saw the first time he went to Latin America, he came back with films he'd taken of the eviction of a, um, an encampment in, I think, Brazil, some, 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 Latin American country where there was a, an encampment being evicted and people were shooting live rounds of fire and you could tell from the film that Brad was like right out there and the bullets were going right by the camera. Jeez. You know, and he was telling other people to get down, but he was actually filming. You know, and the people actually formed a committee to convince Brad not to travel anymore. They tried to get him to not go to Mexico, which he did, and he got killed there. But there was definitely a consciousness that came out of Earth First that was very powerful and very intense, you know. It just needs to be more of a nurturing of, like, a mass consciousness that the stakes are high. I mean, the thing, too, when you think, well, just to go back to what you were talking about, about environmentalism, and it's, like, colonial implications, like, the environmental movement did come out of a far-right thing. Like, a lot of the major big greens were, like, founded by conservationists. And the thing that's also wild is, like, now it's become in a, in a place, I mean, I'm sure it's it's always been like bubbling up in this way, but you know, when we have someone that won a prestigious global award in San Francisco, um, Berta Caceres, who won the Goldman Environmental Prize, which is celebrated by the progressive left, to be killed like literally months after that award, 
like we can't like we can't like ignore the, those things people can't just be like oh yeah let's like shut our light bulbs like let's do our thing like it's like they're real there's a real elixir of intersectional oppression that's showing up here like right wing fascism I mean even like like you know I, I think all the time like, I'm from the uh, I mean my origins are from the Philippines and I mean Duterte with the death squads and the like war on drugs like those things spill spill into everything especially like especially in the states too because we have people from all over the world that have these like complex connections to this country and to like their homelands and it's like there's something's got to give. Like there has to be some sense of international grassroots solidarity. Otherwise, we're gonna be just kind of like reverberating all the trauma that like continues to show up, like with all of it. So. Well, I can piggyback on that. Um, like, and and also go back to what I was saying about like change happening over a long term. I, I don't know how you feel about doing all the work you did in the '80s with Thompson Square with squatting. But it, uh, when I came up, I saw this explosion of things like Funa bombs became really a thing. There was a fight around here locally where people were being arrested just for serving food. And then to this day, now people can serve food Funa bombs and it's a normalized thing. Needle exchange is more becoming more normalized. Perhaps it'll become uh, legalized in some ways where people can have shooting, can, can injunction theft. But um, with the stuff that you just showed earlier with like um, fire in the streets with the comic you drew, like it reminded me of uh, the Reclaim the Streets stuff that happened in the 90s, or even Critical Mass, which like it was like there's this, it was a great flowering in some ways. Yeah. That uh, as I became like an adult, that I saw there was like a movement going on, and I, I feel like they can fucking build in the park, but like uh, what we need to do is instill into people like this relationship with the commons, like mm -hmm. uh, which Reclaim the Streets did with Food Not Bombs does, which uh, Critical Mass does. It's like, we're going to fucking take the space, we're going to gather together, you can have all the fucking cops in the world, you can even kill one of us, but we're still going to be here, and we're going to, we're going to make it a, uh, a festival of life, to, to reference again, mm -hmm. what you're, you guys were saying, and like, um, that's probably going to be the ticket to how we can get out of some of these calamities, and in some ways we're going to have to make, like, uh, the person behind the camera, for example, uh, was involved with, uh, when People's Park failed, they... They were like, okay, well, fuck you. You you take this little spot in Berkeley, we're going to make Earth People's Park. And they even try to buy land in Vermont and stuff like that. So it's just like they, they can kill one of us. It's that saying, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. It's like, like they'll, they'll take our park, but we're going to just, we're going to, which is actually what happened with People's Park. It's like they took the park, and then all of a sudden they started, like, people started, like, um, making People's Park all over the place, in Berkeley, in Santa Barbara, even outside of this country. And I think that's the thing, the message to get out there is like they can, they can damage us a little bit, like these things, but we're not going to get, like, we're not going to lose this um, momentum <coughs> to reclaim the commons or whatever. Now getting back to Judy Berry, when, when she got car bombed, she was in the hospital for like two and a half months, uh, and her whole body was traumatized. But when she recovered, she came back on the front lines. Uh, just as powerful as before. She had to walk with a cane, she was in a lot of pain. But one thing about Earth First also that she really promoted and others is education. We always had made sure that everybody was knew everything about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And that, it, it was contagious. You know, you, you were talking about the Earth Firsters that came to New York and the tactics. Mm -hmm. Everybody was well informed. We were all, we could all speak on the issues. If it, if a ra if a, some somebody came by with a microphone, we could all, sp you know, speak well on issues, and that that was really a positive thing. In regards to People's Park, you know, there were a bunch of houses they tore down to create People's Park. No, they didn't tear them down to create People's Park. They didn't. They tore them down years before the, the People's Park incident happened. They tore them down to get rid of a of a, of a, of a community. And it was a number of years, that was a number of years earlier, and then people... It was a response to the free speech movement. Yes. Yeah. It's almost like can't stand an empty space. The dorms were supposed to go up there, and for many years there was enough of us to stop it, to keep the park, to keep the park. But now we're all getting older, and, and people have drifted away, or they've died, and they think with the younger generation they're not so committed, they can just, they can, they can 
there's a, there's a real threat that they'll move in soon with their development. Yep. No way in New York. Is there any empty spaces in New York, in Manhattan? Just <laughs> his heads, probably. Hmm? It sucks. No community gardens. Oh, there are community gardens. And the community gardens are legalized and um, are um, under the Parks Department, I think. Uh, so most of the community, the majority of the community gardens are secure now. And that was a result of what people did in, uh, in the 90s. Um, a big movement in the 90s. Um, Giuliani wanted to get rid of them, and it actually backfired. It was it was part of the fall of Giuliani. It was it was the you know that that was part of the later period of Giuliani where he was clearly insane. Like at one point, he gave an interview where he said, "Community gardens. They tried that in Russia, and it didn't work." He actually said that, <laughs> and that was what you do. Okay, the guy's brains are falling out of his ear at this point. You know, he's lost it. You know. But, um, well, isn't that a qualification for becoming a Trump spokesperson? Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. The, 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 yeah. They dragged him out of the mothballs when he clearly was not functional, you know. But well, he's he's doing what Trump wants. Yeah, that's for sure. I'd uh, like to just get a reaction from you on one statement. I have a friend back in Indianapolis who's probably about your age, uh, who's one of the best. Uh, Portrait oil painters I've ever met. Phenomenal. He, so, like, he paints people's forehead in such a way, like, you hold so much personality in your forehead, you don't even really realize it. Yeah. He captures that. Yeah. Anyway, he, one night I was hanging out with him and we were taking substances, and he hit me with this statement, which is, art is fascism. And he refused to elucid elucidate on yeah, his reason. I don't reasoning. know what that means. I don't know what that means at all. But he ignited a very, very heated discussion. I, I don't know what the hell he meant by that. <laughs> like, I mean, the word fascism in certain ways became cheapened. Yeah. Where, like, people would just call you fascist if they didn't like you. Right. Or people would call themselves a fascist if they were in a bad mood. Kind of like, you know, right. like, and that's actually been one of the problems in addressing Trump, which is like, every time I hear Trump speak, I feel like he read the same book I read on the rise of the Third Reich, but he thought it was really cool. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. his stuff is almost like textbook examples of mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what an, a classic fascist would say. And so getting people to realize that's a specific thing. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think he meant that. I don't think he meant that art is what Adolf Hitler did. You know, I think he meant something else by it, and you're going to have to talk to him about what he meant. <laughs> well, I have, but yeah, that, you know, there's a way in which certain words get cheapened and get thrown around and get used in ways that are false, and you, just, you know, you just have to deal with that. Well, I think he was more. I can't speak for him, obviously, but I think what he was pointing towards is, and I'll try and use, I, my memory isn't that good, but you mentioned plagiarism and appealing to the uh, the, the small percent of the power group, mm -hmm. and his argument, I would say, is art definitely, at least in the mainstream, does use those techniques. High art, perhaps? Yeah. Right, like commercially successful he, he, he art. Commercially the medium is that, that attached to the idea. Like, I mean, he is saying that art uses that, or art marketing uses yeah. that, or yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, you know, I mean, now um, we're splitting hairs. I mean, I mean, real obviously there are like universal emotional structures, and the right uses them, and the left uses them, and good people use them, and bad people use them. I mean, real obviously, like. You know, the people we're fighting against um, have to know something in order to be successful at what they're doing. You know, I mean, you know, so I'm I'm just not sure what you're saying, really. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's no. Just like it's, it's a weird question. Yeah. I just wanted to see how you're at. How long are so, you going to be here for? Yeah. Um, we're leaving on Wednesday, and I'm Wednesday? here for one more day. Oh. So and we're spending, I'm spending tomorrow with my uncle, too. We can set up more talks to you. What? And would you like to meet Mike DeFerente? 
I'd love to meet Michael Ferrante, but I I need to meet my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle. Who's more important here, Uncle or Michael Ferrante? We can head out to Canada. Quite frankly, I my know, uncle. I, I can read Michael no, Ferrante. Right, I, right. I can't read you're my right. uncle. I didn't mean to cut you off. I had lunch with him today, and I'm thinking you'd like to meet him. He's probably a great guy. He is a good guy. He's from Manhattan. Um, okay. So